On this week's episode of Footnoting History, it's Pancakes Part 2, The Quest for Syrup's Gold. No pancakes in this episode, we're actually talking about the Oneida community again. More sex, more industry, proto-eugenics, and the community breaks up. Strap in, footnoters, we're back at it. What's up, footnoters? It's Josh. If you haven't listened to the first part of the story of the Oneida community, make sure you check out the previous episode. It will definitely help you make sense of this one. Also, I apologize for the flagrant hot shots and city slickers references in the opener. If you don't know what either of those two things are, you probably didn't grow up in the 1990s. But someone out there in the podcastosphere gets it. At least I hope so. Let's get down to it. When we last left the Oneidans, we marveled at their sexual exploits and were perhaps surprised about how John Humphrey Noyes, the founder and head of the community, wove a theology of sex into a community that really lived for each other. For the most part, we're done with the sexual theology side of Oneida. But two things I want to mention really quickly because they're super fascinating and, of course, by fascinating, I mean weird. Noise kept records of who had slept with whom and how often they had coupled. This was mostly so that he and the leadership could keep track of people so that nobody fell prey to the so-called sticky love. Seriously, if you haven't listened to part one, turn back. It'll help you understand. I heard once that there was a public ledger in which the Oneidan men would write down the name of the woman with whom a man wanted to sleep with that night. I haven't found confirmation of that ledger's existence, but Syracuse University has all of the surviving Oneida records. Maybe it's there. And one last thing. Noyes believed that the best sex was sex done in public so older people could enjoy watching it because, you know, they couldn't participate themselves any longer. I'm glad Noise and the Oneidans didn't have the internet because, bruh, yikes on bikes. On that note, let's switch gears just a little bit. By the end of the episode, we're going to talk about spoons. After all, forking leads to spooning. I mentioned last episode that the Oneida community, though it was thoroughly committed to living the communal life, made money for the community and the support of its members through a trap-making business. And that business was doing fairly well. In fact, it made the community financially sustainable. But that seems like a bit of a compromise, doesn't it? Industrial labor and the sort of communism that Noise believed in in practice, they don't seem compatible at first glance. Noise did not care for individualism, but he wasn't completely against capitalism, so long as capitalism was used for good. And interestingly, Noise was fascinated with the technology of industrial capitalism particularly canals, steamboats, and railroads. In fact, he saw these technological advancements as signs that the world was coming to its end soon. Not in a bad way. Remember, the end of the world is a good thing as far as noise is concerned, because it meant that one, he had succeeded in his mission, and two, that Christ would be here soon. And it's that apocalyptic fervor that drove the Oneidans' business to expand. Noise and the community came to believe that their continued success in their trap making was a sign of God's favor. And the more business contacts the Oneidans made, the more other businesses would adopt the Oneidan practices and turn their business towards Christ and mutual aid. It's kind of like a capitalistic Calvinism. I know that sounds weird. And in other words, they're blending capitalism into their communism. Capitalism was the engine that allowed communism to become reality, as far as the Oneidans were concerned. But if you think their communist credentials are in jeopardy here, bro, no way. 
They strongly believed in an equal distribution of capital or profits to all members of the community. And they also lived by the credo, each according to his ability, each according to his need. However, the Oneidans weren't going to be planting any Soviet flags in the ground. When Marx and Lenin cried, seize the means of production, Noyes would respond and say, the captains of industry can control the means of production, but through Christ, they will stop exploiting labor. Noyes, my friend, I have some news for you, and you're not going to like it. In any event, like I said last episode, the Oneidans, at first, did not use wage labor to manufacture their traps. It was all done in-house. They believed that wage labor was inherently exploitative and just didn't fit their values. In fact, one of the main criticisms the Oneidans made of the outside world was its reliance on wage labor and the devaluing of the worker. But of course, things changed. Their trap manufacturing became more mechanized. The trap business expanded beyond the community's wildest imaginations. They couldn't keep up with production demand. And they had started spinning silk for another source of income. So where did they turn? Wage labor. To be fair, the Oneidans did try to treat their wage workers more humanely than the outside world did, but the realities of factory work really overrode any of their efforts. And so the Oneida community built a fortune on the backs of the workers that they hired. They even bought an ivy-covered mansion into which the community moved. They even regularly manicured their lawn. Serious American middle class vibes here, guys. But trap making and silk spinning were not the only changes in Oneida. Noyes hatched a new plan to keep his dream of perfectionism alive, and he called it stirpiculture. Stirpiculture was the first experiment in positive eugenics in American history. Let's make one thing crystal clear before we go forward. Stirpiculture is eugenics. Positive eugenics, to be precise. Positive eugenics seeks to selectively breed people with desirable traits. That's opposed to negative eugenics, which discourages people with undesirable traits from having children. Now, you're probably wondering how we got here. How did we go from free love community to a eugenics experiment? It's a good question. And quite frankly, the answer is that it had been there, lying in wait all along. One thing that I skipped over in the first episode was one of the central practices of the early Oneidans. And it's not that I thought it wasn't important, but I wanted to save it for now, because I think it makes more sense narratively. This practice was called mutual criticism. Mutual criticism involved a member of the community submitting themselves to the scrutiny of the community. A member would come before a committee of community members, which rotated every so often, and they would take criticism, both positive and negative, in order to become better members of the community. I know that doesn't sound quite like eugenics, but think about it for a second. Through these mutual criticism sessions, the community was defining what were good traits and what were bad traits. Good traits got positive reinforcement, and this was done in front of the whole community. While not explicitly required, Noise encouraged members to undergo criticism several times a year, or in particularly recalcitrant cases, maybe once a month. And oh, I'm so sorry, but let me get into the weeds a bit here because this is so interesting to me and I think you're going to find it interesting too. Noyes, honestly a consummate theologian, developed a fascinating cosmology. That is, explanation for how the universe is ordered. Noyes, and through him the Oneidans, conceived of the universe as being composed of three realms. Earth, heaven, and Hades, the realm of the dead. 
the unbaptized dead specifically. Each of these realms contained shades and demons, powers and principalities, both good and bad spirits. Just as an aside, powers and principalities comes from the letters of Paul of Tarsus, aka Saint Paul or the Apostle Paul. Paul talks about both good and bad powers and principalities, kind of like they're the foot soldiers of each side's spiritual armies. That's a massive oversimplification, but I hope it's helpful. The Oneidans took this a step further and used powers and principalities to explain both bad and good behavior. Got an annoying, chronic cough? Dark spirit. Are you an attention seeker? Prima donna spirit. To attach to one lover in Oneida? Sticky spirit. To in love with pancakes? Syrup spirit. Actually, I just made that one up. I was trying to think like an Oneidan about my love of pancakes. In any event, mutual criticism was designed to exercise the bad spirits that caused undesirable behavior and traits. And even John Humphrey Noyes submitted himself to criticism every so often, even if the community went a little light on their leader. So I think the connection between mutual criticism and eugenics is pretty clear. Though, of course, one uses the language of religion far more explicitly than the other, which uses the language of science. And if you're wondering how a cult like Oneida could be into science, two things. Religion and science are not mutually exclusive ways of understanding the world. I say this as someone who studies religion as a part of making my living. It's a sensitive spot for me. More importantly, the Oneidans were totally STEM people. I mentioned earlier that Noyes had an obsession with industrial technology. He had the same fascination with the new developments in scientific research as well, as did many community members. In fact, more than a handful of Oneidans went to Yale University to study biology. They were well steeped in the science of the time. Noyes' eugenics experiment was unique. Rather than focusing on physical traits or predispositions to certain medical conditions, Noyes focused on spiritual qualities. Stay with me for a minute here, but Noyes, as we talked about in the last episode, believed that human beings were these spiritual batteries that could be charged through sex. And once the battery got enough charge, the person would achieve immortality. After coming to understand a bit about genetics and breeding, Noyes came to believe that selective breeding of people could produce a more perfect perfectionist, a human being more capable of conducting that sexual spiritual energy. And of course, because it's John Humphrey Noyes, it got weird. Noyes claimed that he was in telepathic communication with Paul of Tarsus. Yes, that Paul, who would help him sort through his thoughts. And wouldn't you know, Noyes came out of those conversations with Paul with a pretty interesting revelation. Since he, Noyes, was the closest to immortality among the Oneidans, more women should have sex with him, and he should get the women he deemed spiritually worthy pregnant so that they could produce more spiritually fit children. Shocking, but unsurprising, right? Noy shared this revelation with the community and called for volunteers, not necessarily to have sex with him specifically, but to be a part of a spiritually elite pool of people who would have children who would have the best of their qualities. 53 women volunteered, as did 38 men. With the pool having been filled, Noyes asked the volunteers to couple themselves in whatever combinations they wanted, and then submit that pairing for review by a committee of community members. But of course, Noyes had the final word himself. 51 couple pairings applied, 
42 were approved, nine were rejected. Eventually, 58 children were born from these eugenic unions. The community called them Sterpicults. There's a lot more to the story here, and I think it's well worth diving into a future episode somewhere down the line. We do have a couple of episodes on the origin of American eugenics in our back catalog, and while they don't discuss Oneida, they can sate your appetite for knowledge about how other Americans later on practiced eugenics. But I don't want to leave you hanging, so let me give you some tidbits. Once a child was born, they stayed with their mother for only 15 months. But after 15 months, the child and mother were separated. After all, in the Oneida community, attachment was forbidden. At 15 months, the child would be moved to the children's house, where they would be raised by the community and instructed in the values of non-attachment. Except for the community, of course. The integrity of the community's values were of the most importance. But let's address the elephant in the room. Whatever the noble goals of the stirpiculture experiment, in practice, Sterpa culture gave noise even tighter control over the sexual lives of the community, and he wielded that power without hesitation, often placing his followers into tragic situations and circumstances. And of course, it gave him first choice over who he himself would partner with. And he really fancied his niece, Tirza Miller. Tirza Miller deserves her own episode, and if you're as fascinated by this story as I am, you'll read everything in the episode bibliography. But long story short, Tirza Miller loved having sex, and was the apple of many community men's eyes. Noyes knew this and used it to his advantage often. Tirza Miller's journals survived the purge of records by the descendants of the community later on, and it's been published. I'd love to get my hands on it. But it's a fascinating and tragic part of the story. I, I really can't recommend following up on this episode enough. So what we have here is a theocratic dictatorship with noise at the head. And if you know the general pattern in world history, as I'm sure you do, you know that regimes like this often collapse over a succession crisis. Oneida was no different. Noyes himself preferred his son Theodore to take over the reins of the community when it was time. Theodore was intelligent and well-liked, and when the time came, he assumed leadership of the community when John Humphrey Noyes felt the effects of his age and began to fall ill. John Humphrey Noyes would have his son be his successor despite the objections of some community members. Theodore took the reins in 1877. Theodore's stint as community leader was fairly disastrous, and it sowed a lot of seeds of discontent in the community. Of particular note was that Theodore, in 1872, had declared himself an agnostic and left the community. He was gone for a week, and had a reconversion when he returned. But regardless of that conversion, doubt about his commitment to the community never dissipated. And when conflict arose with his main partner and Hobart, Hobart accused him of apostasy. John Humphrey Noyes decided that Theodore's wavering belief in the community was a product of his attachment to Anne. Theodore disagreed, and as a result, Theodore had to resign from his position after just seven months. Things went from bad to worse for Oneida when one of the arch-villains of American history started his moral crusade. Anthony Comstock, as special agent for the New York Committee for the Suppression of Vice, made it his business to stamp out anything obscene. In practice, this meant things like playing cards with naked women on them and contraceptives had to go. In 1873, the so-called Comstock Law passed, prohibiting the circulation of advertisements for contraceptives and information about abortion 
a very common practice in 19th century America, from being circulated in the U.S. mail. Now, Noyes, because he's Noyes, published a lot of his work on things like mutual criticism and stirpiculture, but he'd also published on male continence, a form of birth control, and he'd been sending it through the mail. Comstock, though, wouldn't come for Noyes, but a man inspired by Comstock did. A Protestant minister named John Mears made it his business to destroy the Oneida community once and for all. Knowing what the Oneidans practiced and emboldened by the criminalization of bigamy in Mormon Utah in 1878, Mears did his level best to undo Oneida. However, Oneida was also coming apart from the inside. After the Theodore fiasco, prominent members of the community, particularly William Hines and James Towner, began to call for the democratic election of the leader of the community and eventually an end to complex marriage. Noyes obviously felt the pressure and, being a very paranoid person, fled New York for Canada. He didn't have to go too far, just to Niagara Falls, where he lived out the rest of his days. With Noyes essentially unseated from power, James Towner and William Hines enacted several reforms. First and foremost, they got the community to agree to the democratic election of community leadership, instituting a representative government in the running of the community. What split the community was complex marriage. Some of the community wanted to continue complex marriage the way it always had. Others wished to keep it around but be left up to individual choice. Still others, particularly the young, even the Sturpicults, wanted a change to complete monogamy. But what's clear here is that individualism had come to Oneida. And indeed, the same thing happened in the economic life of the community as well. The split in the community ran so deep that in July of 1880, a resolution was presented to the community that recognized the stalemate over complex marriage and commissioned a report on how to move the community's economic interests forward despite the split. The report didn't have any good news. And with much acrimony, the community decided that it would be reorganized into a joint stock company called Oneida Community Limited. Stock was distributed by the amount of money a person had put into the community. So, rather than being egalitarian, the new Oneida socioeconomic situation became rigidly hierarchical. And their businesses were going under some changes as well. While trap making had been their principal source of income for years, making iron spoons had suddenly rocketed up to being their most profitable enterprise. Thanks to the purchase of an idle factory on the property of one of the satellite communities in Wallingford, Connecticut. And that, folks, is how you get Oneida flatware on your kitchen table. I mean, there's a lot more to the story. I really want to encourage you to follow up with the further reading. For now, let's just say that the Oneida Community Limited became very interested in distancing themselves from their origins. They even burned all of the records of the community in the 1940s. So now it comes time for my usual question. What do we do with the Oneida community? Is it a weird religious cult? Maybe, but I think that's reductive. Oneida, despite Noise's weird and often perverse theology, was the representation of a lot of people's hopes and dreams. Whether those dreams were about a sense of family and belonging, or a quest for eternal life living in God's kingdom. At least for the northern part of the United States, Oneida represents much of what the 19th century was for this country. In the most unorthodox of ways, of course, but so much is here. Industrialization, religious innovation, communalism, emerging science and technology, corporatization. So much of what was happening and what would happen 
in the 19th century United States. In other words, take Oneida seriously. You will never be able to see past the sex part, especially Noyes insisting on sleeping with girls as young as 13. That's disgusting. But there's something of worth here, even if it seems a little sticky. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Footnoting History. Don't forget to head over to footnotinghistory.com for visuals, links, and sources related to the Oneidans. Don't forget that all of our episodes are now on YouTube, complete with closed captions. Please go visit our channel, like our videos, and subscribe if you love it. If you'd like to interact with us, we're on Twitter as at History Footnote, or Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest as at Footnoting History. We'd love to hear from you, and remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes. Mm-hmm.